good evening. We'll go ahead and make a wee start, and others will come and join with us. We're going to turn tonight to the lovely hymn, hymn number 100. O Christ, what burdens bowed thy head. Our load was laid in thee, thou stoodest in the sinner's stead, didst bear all ill for me. 216 is the page number. Let's stand together and we'll sing this great hymn of praise unto the Lord. Let's have a wee word of prayer together. Eternal God and loving Heavenly Father, 
we ask thee to remember us tonight as we gather for this another gospel service. We're so thankful of thy promise where two or three are gathered together in my name. There am I in the midst. And we rejoice tonight in the knowledge that we're here in the precious name of the Lord Jesus. And how thrilled we are that we read in the scriptures unto you there which believe. He is precious. And we're glad tonight that many here have a testimony, not only to the saving and keeping power of Jesus Christ as Lord and Redeemer, but to the preciousness of the Redeemer in all the outworking and aspects of the Christian life. And we're thankful that he is to us tonight Lord and Saviour. He's the shepherd and bishop of our soul. We thank thee that he is to those of us who know and love him, the lily of the valley, the bright and the morning star, the, the rose of Sharon Fair. But we thank thee that he is the best and greatest friend of all. And we look to thee this evening as we, Lord, once again preach the gospel. And as gospel light and gospel truth is sounded forth, and sent out in the precious name of Christ, we make a prayer unto thee, Lord. Have mercy on those that hear the word of God. We pray that thou will send thy light and thy truth. We pray that thou will bring understanding. We ask thee that thou will, in such a way, open the eyes of those that are spiritually blind, that they might see themselves as thou dost see them. And that they'll come and bow the knee like the publican. God be merciful to me the sinner. Lord come and open the ears of those that are spiritually deaf. Let them know that it's the voice of the Lord. And we pray that thou will tremble. Is it not written to this man I will look. To him that is poor. And who is contrite in spirit. And who trembleth at my word. Lord there's little trembling today at thy word. Lord there's no real fear of thee. Lord, even though it's written, it's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. And we ask thee that in our day that thou might restore something, even of the fear of God. For we know the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And knowledge of the holy is understanding. Lord, many are devoid of understanding. Even those in the higher echelons of society, those that we would say, who are well educated and have brains to burn. And Lord, they're so articulate, even in their language and speech. And yet many of them, Lord, are devoid of understanding. They don't know thee. They don't know our blessed Redeemer, Jesus Christ. They have no shepherd with them on the journey. Lord, they don't know him as Lord or Savior. They, they don't know him that he's the best friend of all. Lord, have mercy upon them. We pray this for young and old. We ask thee that thou might visit and give household salvation. We pray, Lord, for the restoration of those that are cold and backslidden, not only in our family circles, but outside of it. Lord, we're conscious it's the holiday time, and we're conscious in the goodness of the weather that many, Lord, are off today, and we commend them to thee. We pray that you'll help them to remember even that it is the Sabbath, the day of rest. And we pray that wherever they're at, whatever they're doing, that they might even tune in and listen for a time into the service. Help them to join with us in our worship. As we offer praise, as we read the scriptures, as we offer prayer, as we preach the word of God, let there be a hearty amen in heart and mind at this time. We just commit ourselves now unto thee. Remember us, show us a token for good. And we pray that thou might even visit our land. We think of we Northern Ireland and all its need. We think of our past history, the way you've dealt with us. You sent three glorious heaven-sent revivals. 1625, 1859, the 1920s. Lord, thou dost give us a little reviving in our bondage, even during the ministry of thy late servant, uh, Dr. Paisley. And Lord, we long for such times again. We long for the breath of God. We long, Lord, for a, an excitement and a desire to be found once more in the house of God. We just commit ourselves unto thee at this time. We know that the people are fearful. We know that many are fretting. And we ask thee, Lord, in the midst of their fear and fretful state, that thou reveal thyself. 
as a God who's able to save, as a God who's able to supply and meet their need. Lord, hear our cry. Help them to come to the place when they ask the question, is there any word from God? We pray that we'll be able to answer, yes, there is. We know that many, many pulpits are giving an uncertain sound. Is it any wonder churches are empty? Lord, we pray that you'll help us to be faithful to the blood in the book, faithful to preach the whole counsel of God without fear or favor. Faithful, Lord, in the sense that all we desire and long for is the well done of God. Hear prayer at this time. Just shut us now in with thee. Bless us. Help us at this hour. And Lord, be mindful of all who are absent from us. Meet their need wherever they're at, whatever they're doing. Put your hand upon them for good and encourage them with your word. For we ask it for Jesus' sake. Amen. Amen. We're going to continue to worship the Lord. We're turning to the hymn at 200 and 271. Free from the law, O happy condition. Jesus has bled, and there is remission. Cursed by the law, bruised by the fall, grace hath redeemed us once for all. And when it says free from the law, just remember that you're free from its condemnation. You're not free from its code. You're still under the law. 271, we'll sing the verse together as the Lord helps us. with me tonight in your Bibles to Numbers chapter 21. 
Numbers chapter 21. We're going to read verses 1 through to 9. It's very interesting this week. Wednesday past, I was um, dealing with two situations, at least in my mind. Um, I received news that two of our people had been bitten. One was bitten by a dog, and the other was bitten by a world fish. And, uh, of course, the thought of being bitten was in my mind, Um, providentially I was uh, thinking of this particular uh, story in the Bible on the children of Israel were bitten by the fiery serpents so hence turning to this passage tonight I believe is providential Numbers 21 we're going to read the first nine verses let's hear the word of God and when King Arad the Canaanite which dwelt in the south heard tell that Israel came by the way of the spies. Then he fought against Israel and took some of them prisoners. And Israel vowed a vow unto the Lord and said, If thou will indeed deliver this people into my hand, then I will utterly destroy their cities. And the Lord hearkened to the voice of Israel and delivered up the Canaanites, and they utterly destroyed them and their cities. And he called the name of the place Hormath. And they journeyed from Mount Hor by the way of the Red Sea to compass the land of Edom. And the soul of the people was much discouraged because of the way. And the people spake against against God and Moses. Wherefore have ye brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no bread. Neither is there any water, and our soul loatheth the slight bread. And the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people, and much people of Israel died. Therefore the people came to Moses and said, We have sinned, for we have spoken against the Lord and against thee. Pray unto the Lord that he take away the serpents from us. And Moses prayed for the people. And the Lord said unto Moses, Take thee a fiery serpent and set it upon a pole and it shall come to pass when every one that is bitten when he looketh upon it shall live. And Moses made a serpent of brass and put it upon a pole and it came to pass that if a serpent had bitten any man when he beheld the serpent of brass he lived. Amen. We'll end the reading there at verse 9. And we know the Lord will stamp with his own approval and blessing this reading of his own precious and infallible word. Now, we do welcome all tonight. We thank you for coming. And for those who are visiting with us, it's really good to have you. Uh, It's such an encouragement in the light of the fact that it's the holiday time. The sun has been shining all week and many are away at different places. So thank you for turning out this evening. Uh, Do remember uh, all who are online as well, and we thank you for uh, your faithfulness in joining with us as part of our online community. Now, a few necessary announcements. Um, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday, uh, we're having a holiday Bible club here. The buses will leave the church about 6.30 and go ahead and gather up the children. We hope to start the meeting about 7, and the meeting will be over about a quarter past 8 or thereabouts each evening. We've quite a number of volunteers to help, and that's tremendous. Um, We've got the little leaflet here, Holiday Bible Club, and if any can help, Uh, tomorrow afternoon or whatever time you want to have a little chat with me afterwards then we can go out round the doors uh, and seek to encourage the children uh, to come Um, the only addition is that on the Wednesday night we'll have the prayer meeting here and we'll set up the lecturing and then on Friday night we're um, attempting something slightly different uh, in the running of the format of the meeting we're trying to encourage parents to come with the children and uh, we want to encourage our own young people to come and join us what are they doing on friday night well they're, they're probably at home there's maybe no band parades or anything to attend so come here and we'll give you some uh, thing to eat 
and we'll have a little bit of fellowship. So there's going to be hot food for the parents and for the young people of the church and the children as well. So do remember that and be much in prayer for this special venture because without prayer, we can really do nothing and we need the Lord's help in this particular matter. Also, we ask that you remember then next Lord's Day, just the usual services, 11.30 and 7, preceded by the times of prayer. And in the will of God, I again will be here and I will be the preacher. And hopefully those on holidays will be back and we'll have a good turnout. I'm not sure whether it'll be tomorrow, Sunday morning or Sunday night, but I'm going to attempt to preach a message. This morning we looked on the agony and the acceptance of afflictions in relation to the Christian and the Christian life. Remember David said, it's good for me uh, that uh, I have been afflicted uh, and uh, that, that I might learn thy statutes. Well, I, I want to do another message tying in from that, and it's this, the bitterness and the betterment of bereavement. How many of God's people have experienced the bitterness of bereavement? And how do they cope with that? And that's a heavy burden for many of them. And they're carrying that burden. So we're going to try and deal with that subject. It may be Sabbath evening. It may be uh, Sabbath morning. I, I just don't know yet. So we'll look to the Lord for how he leads. But anyway, I've given you that announcement. And we trust and pray that we'll have the help of the Lord. Uh, we also want to take the opportunity to um, thank the Lord for two gifts for our building work. And I've got the gifts here. Uh, I've got a gift of uh, 500 pounds. And we thank the lady who donated uh, this money. Uh, God bless you. And I have another gift for 100 pounds. And this was given to me in Bush Mills uh, some weeks ago. And I apologize. It's only being handed in now. Uh, so do remember that, please. And we trust and pray that the Lord will lead us as we go forward. I said this morning, there's something like, this is the bank's own um, communication. There's something like 14 billion old banknotes missing. So many 20 pound banknotes and so many 50 pounds. I think the ratio might be something like um, eight and uh, six or something. Um, so if you have old banknotes, I have to tell you that you can't spend them in the shops after the 30th of September. Uh, so if you have old banknotes and rather than deposit them in the bank, if you want to donate them to the work of God, then uh, you can do that, and we'll uh, be happy to accept them. Uh, do pray for our building work. We're planning now to, to go into the, we'll really call it the second phase of the work. We need to get uh, our walls and gates up, our boundary fences erected. We need to get the car park underway. We want to have space in the will of God for a graveyard. We need to see, of course, and take steps to get the uh, church hall at the back up and then the, the work at the front uh, upstairs finished to the glory of God. Now, that's going to cost an awful lot of money if we're thinking about a, a base coat of tarmac as well and, of course, a sign at the side of the road. We'll not forget the sign. So, so we have a lot to do, but we need your help and we need your prayers and all I'm asking you to do is to pray uh, and uh, ask the Lord to help them in Carry Duff. Uh, he's done it before and I believe that he can do it again. We we'll encourage you to remember uh, our people in prayer, especially Bobby Graham and Sadie, and we say hello to them. We're thinking also of Stanley Cook at this time. We're thinking of Rita uh, as she recovers, uh, not only from the death of Wesley, uh, but of course from this bite with this dog. Uh, so do remember her. Remember those that are facing surgery. Remember those that are recovering from surgery. Those that are coping with big illnesses. And there's a number attached to the congregation. And our thoughts and prayers are with them. And uh, we, we just look to the Lord for his help. There was a good protest yesterday in Cookstown. And we thank God for that. There's also prayer requests for a gospel mission in Leitrim, and that's uh, somewhere in the direction of Money Slain. So do remember that, please, also in prayer. And we are planning a youth outing at the end of September. I send out a wee communique on WhatsApp uh, with the young people, and I'm waiting their response. So do remember that, please. Uh, and we look to the Lord for his help as we seek to move the work of God uh, forward. Now, these are all the announcements. They're subject to God's will. We're going to sing a few verses, just a few verses of 245. Let's sing the verse 1 and the verse 3 seated. And then um, we'll um, stand for the verse 6 
of the hymn. There's six verses and six choruses. We'll not sing it all, and we'll just sing half of it. 245, verses 1 and 3 seated, and then we'll stand for verse 6. And for the sixth verse, please. prayer together. Lord, we ask thee now as we turn to thy precious word, as we have read a portion of Holy Scripture, come and illuminate the sacred page. Is it not written, the entrance of thy word giveth light, it giveth understanding to the simple. And we think of those, Lord, that stand in need of that light, those that are not saved, send thy light and truth. Those that are backslidden, send thy light and truth. Those that are struggling, Lord, send thy light and thy truth. Lord, we pray like David, help thou us. Lord, cleanse now in the blood, quicken by the Holy Spirit, and cause thy word to be a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. And Lord, help us to go out of the house of God saying, I've got a word from the Lord. Hear prayer at this time. Speak to all who are online. Lord, especially those that are not saved, save them, we pray. And we look to thee that you'll add even to our church family. Lord, add new families to the word of God. Give us encouragement this autumn time. Surprise us what you're going to do. Send us all the necessary finance and our plans, Lord, for the building. We leave it at thy feet. We say again, help thou us, for we look to thee as Jehovah Jireh. Just remember us now. Bless us, help us, do us good, do the same for all our elderly, every shut-in one at this time, those recovering from operations, those, Lord, facing operations, you know who they are, those that are struggling with terminal illness, we commend them to thee, whether it's James or Gareth or Gareth Care or others, you know all about them and you know their need. Minister Grace, we pray, just bless us now, be with us, we ask, even with the children. Meet us, Lord, at the point of our need. Bless them, even in the Holy Bible Club. Lord, bless our, our, our labors for thee. Surprise us to what you're going to do, Lord. Do it in Jesus' name. For it's in his name we pray. Amen. Now, my text tonight is taken from Numbers, chapter 21, verses 8 and 9. 
And I've entitled this message, The Brazen Serpent and the Blood of the Savior. Now in Numbers chapter 20, the children of Israel are encamped at Kadesh Barnea. It's the southern border of the promised land. They have been in the wilderness now for about 39 or 40 years. Remember, the wilderness was a great and terrible wilderness. And the children of Israel faced much hardship, difficulty. They had many afflictions. On this occasion, Moses sought permission from the king of Edom to pass through his territory. He promised, we'll not touch your crops. We'll not drink your water. All we want to do is pass through your territory. The king of Edom refused. He threatened military action if they attempted to do it. After the death of Aaron, the Canaanite king Arad, he was situated north of where the children of Israel were camped. He came and fought against Israel. They sought the Lord. They vowed to live for the Lord and serve him all their days if he helped them get victory over their enemies and capture their cities, which he did. The Lord gave the victory. This was the first victory in Canaan land. However, he tested them. Instead of going into the promised land from the south as to where they were located, the Lord directed Moses to turn around and lead the people by the Red Sea to bring them into the Gulf of Aquaba. This was a a circular route around the land of Edom. At this time, the children of Israel began to murmur because of the journey. They were discouraged. They became impatient. They grumbled and complained against God and against Moses. They made false accusations against the leaders. They, They said, you have brought us into the wilderness to die here. We're fed up with this man. We, we lack proper food. We, we, we lack water. And Moses, it's your fault. Now they complained so much that the Lord sent fiery serpents among them to bite them. And this bite of the serpents was a, a poisonous bite. And many died. Listen to chapter 21, verse 6. And the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people, and much people of Israel died. Now I want you to think of the march of death in the camp. These fiery serpents, they may have been colorful, but when they bit you, that bite was a poisonous bite. It was a very painful, slow, agonizing death. Think of the bite of a rattlesnake and the slow, agonizing death if you have no um, antidote um, to, to administer. Thankfully, the people recognized their sin. They confessed it before God. They repented of it. And they asked for Moses to intercede for them before God. Now, when Moses prayed, and we read that there in verse 7, and Moses prayed for the people. Now, the Lord provided a most unusual remedy for their healing and salvation. And this was the Lord's remedy. And Moses made a servant of brass and put it upon a pole. And it came to pass that if a serpent had bitten any man, when he beheld the serpent of brass, he lived. You've got to think now, here's the unusual remedy, a brazen serpent on a pole. And the people's told, whosoever looks to this bronze snake in the pole, you're going to be healed. You're going to live. Hence the singing tonight, look and live. Now, Now, why? Why not just command them to go away if he commanded them to come into the camp? Why not tell Moses, Moses, you stand at the middle of the camp or in the periphery of the camp, use your rod and say, I banish you out of our camp. He could have done that. He could have said, well, get the people to chase them away with their sticks or their their brooms. Why this unusual remedy? Well, turn with me tonight to John chapter 3, and we read there in verses 13 and 14. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, 
but have eternal life. You see, here's the divine explanation for this most unusual remedy for their healing and salvation. This lifting up of the brazen serpent on a pole, it was an illustration of, it pointed to a, a vivid picture of Christ in the cross shedding his precious blood for all that would trust him and believe in him as Lord and Redeemer. Here was God's divine remedy from sin unto salvation. Now, as I thought of these ladies that reported the bites to me, I was thinking of this particular story. Three things came to mind, and I, I wrote them down on Wednesday evening. One, the necessity of this divine remedy. Now, I want you to think of the camp of Israel. They're round by the Red Sea, as I said, the Gulf of Aquaba, the desert area. And to this day, if you were there, you could see and hear snakes. I'm not saying they're fiery serpents, but they're certainly you could see and hear snakes in that locality. And we're told that these fiery serpents come into the camp because of their sin of murmuring, their sin of complaining, and their, and their sin of jealousy against Moses and against God. In other words, the Lord sent them. Isn't that what the Bible tells us? Verse 6, And the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people, and much people of Israel died. So you think of these fiery serpents, young people, coming into the camp, and they're biting the children of Israel. And as a result of that poisonous bite, many died. You've got to think of a camp of about 2 million people. 600,000 men, every man had a woman and at least one child, possibly two, there was more than 2 million. So we've got to think of men and women and children, young people dying of the bite of the serpent. Now, now think with me from a spiritual perspective. You see, the reality is we have all been bitten by the serpent of old. Remember, it was the serpent who deceived Eve. It was the one whom Adam listened to and disobeyed God. And that poisonous bite infected an entire human race. We'll talk about the poisonous bite of sin. And I believe tonight in a real literal Adam and Eve, it's not a fairy story. These individuals are not a figment of our imagination. God says in Genesis 2, 17 to Adam, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it, for in the day thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. Surely die means in dying, thou shalt die. And we link it up with what we read in Romans chapter 5 and 12, wherefore as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. Not just physical death. You've got to think of spiritual death. You've got to think of eternal death. Because when we think of the penalty of death, it's threefold, physical, spiritual, and eternal. Remember what Isaiah the prophet preached, and he was the evangelical prophet of the Old Testament. And in Isaiah chapter 1 and verse 6 and 7, we read, The whole head is sick and the whole heart faint. From the sole of the foot even unto the head, there's no soundness in it, but wounds and bruises and putrefying sores. They have not been closed, neither bound up, neither mollified with ointment. Your country is desolate. Your cities are burned with fire. Your land, strangers devour it in your presence. And it is desolate as overthrown by strangers. And over there in the New Testament, in the Gospel of Mark, in Mark chapter 7, the Lord Jesus reveals the um, true state and condition of the human heart. He revealed to us there the sins that are found in the human heart. He says, for from within, Mark 7, 21, out of the heart of man proceed evil thoughts, adulteries, fornications, murders, theft, covetousness, wickedness, deceit, lasciviousness, an evil eye, blasphemy, pride, foolishness. All these evil things come from within and defile the man. And you know, sometimes when I'm in a public space, I'm tempted to people watch. And I, I think of this world 
that's fallen in sin and in a state of misery. I think of the uh, toll that sin has taken on the human race. I, I see individuals with physical infirmities, some who are drug addicts, some who are alcoholics, some who are given over to other substance abuse. People's bodies are broken. People's bodies are deteriorating. And yet they're made in the image of God. And you see them there and you discover and you remember the way of the transgressor is hard. I, I see people in their sensuality and in their immoral behavior. We, we see and hear the anger uh, of maybe parents yelling at children. Children being disobedient to their parents. Couples arguing even in public spaces. We hear of theft, murder. We hear of abortion. Fornication, gambling, um, homosexuality, um, adultery and, uh, and immorality, anti-God spirit, anti-God rhetoric. And it's all proof. It's all proof of what? That we've been bitten by the evil serpent with the poisonous bite of sin. We've all been affected by sin and hence we're all under a sentence of death. The necessity of the divine remedy. Now what is that remedy? Notice, secondly, the nature of the divine remedy. Now look with me again at Numbers chapter 21. And the Lord said unto Moses, Make thee a fiery serpent, and set it upon a pole. And it shall come to pass that when every one that is bitten, when he looketh upon it, shall live. And Moses made a serpent of brass, and put it upon a pole. And it came to pass that if a serpent had bitten any man, when he beheld the serpent of brass, he lived. Now, I want you to focus with me on the word of God. Why a brazen serpent on a pole? Why did God tell Moses to make a fiery serpent? Why do we read, and Moses made a serpent of brass and put it on a pole? Because chiefly, now listen to me carefully, that brazen serpent on a pole displayed and portrayed the death of the Lord Jesus Christ on the cross. That is what John chapter 3 verses 14 and 15 is all about. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. The Lord told Moses to make, not take, but to make a fiery serpent of brass, put it upon a pole. And that fiery serpent of brass was to portray a type of the Lord Jesus, because only the Lord Jesus is the real, true Savior of sinners. And we cannot, we must not interpret this type in any other way. John 3, verses 14 and 15, teaches us that what Moses did what God told him to do in this unusual remedy was a prefiguration of the cross work of Christ. Do you want you to think of the death of the Lord Jesus on the cross? Do you know that five times John makes reference to the nature of his death? Think of a brazen serpent lifted up and set on a pole. Think of Jesus Christ being lifted up. It's significant because the emphasis is on the nature of his death by crucifixion. The Son of Man must be lifted up, John 3 and 14. John 8, 28, when you have lifted up the Son of Man. John 12 and 32, and if I be lifted up. John 8 and 34 speaks again about the lifting up of Christ. The Son of Man must be lifted up. John 17 and 1 speaks again in his high priestly prayer about being lifted up. It's significant. Five times, five in the Bible is the number of grace. And every time it mentions being lifted up in these references, it's an emphasis on the death that he should die. And he didn't die accidentally. He, he, he didn't die by stoning. No, his death was by being lifted up. It was by crucifixion. It was by being lifted up and nailed to the tree and his blood shed and as a consequence he bled and died on behalf of sinners. It's significant. Make thee a fiery serpent and set it on a pole. It signifies, folks, that Christ would be lifted up, set on a tree, that he would be crucified, 
that he would suffer this particular form of death. And I'll tell you, crucifixion is a terrible form of death. It's a public execution. It was reserved for the worst of criminals. It was a a, a death of shame and, and deep ignominy and also deep agony. And the emphasis here, as we focus on the word of God, is on the necessity of Christ's death. The serpent must be lifted up and set on a pole. The saviour must be lifted up and set forth on a tree if anyone's going to be healed. I have focused on the words, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up and remind himself it was necessary for Christ to die. The Bible says without the shedding of blood, there is no remission. And how was his blood to be shed? Lifted up in the horrible death of crucifixion. And that's a unique feature of the blood atonement. The absolute necessity of Christ's death by crucifixion. And and that's what we focus on in the word of God. But there's something else here as we think of this nature of the divine remedy. It focused on the wisdom of God. You see, this was God's plan. It says, and the Lord said unto Moses. It was revealed from the Lord to Moses. It was a a plan that human wisdom could never have contrived of. This is a plan that's contrary to human reasoning, human wisdom. It's contrary to the wisdom of the world. It's not related to religiosity. It's it's not related to self-righteousness. It's not related to money. It's not related to the church or the pastor or the priest. At the heart of this instruction, for the cure of bitten souls, they were looked to look to a, a serpent of brass upon a pole. And if they did, there was instant life and instant healing to all who obeyed. And remember, God's way is contrary to the wisdom of this world. It says in the scriptures here, and we've read them together, and I emphasize them, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but half eternal life. Believe, believeth means to um, put your faith and trust and lean your whole weight upon Christ for salvation. It's not only based on the word of God and the wisdom of God, but it's also based on the justice of God. Now, I want you to think tonight, the Lord in, revealed in the scriptures The God of the Bible is a holy God and he can and does justly impose the death sentence on the sinner. It's a just sentence and it's rooted in God's holy justice. You think of the children of Israel, they were suffering an exact punishment for sin. They had sinned against the Lord. Sin remembers a transgression of the law and yet in his wisdom and in his mercy, he provided a wonderful remedy. And yet that remedy he provided upheld his righteousness. It satisfied his holy justice. It fully fulfilled his broken law. And only on this basis can sin be pardoned and put away. Here's a doctrine, the justice of God, that needs to be preached and emphasized today, rediscovered today. It's a doctrine that's lost. Sin's treated so lightly as if it... It doesn't matter, and it's not much thought of today. It's okay. God in heaven winks at sin. Well, he doesn't. Here's an absolute necessity of the death of Christ by crucifixion, shedding his blood. To do what? To satisfy divine justice. To fulfill the demands of the holy law of God. Think of this. Jesus had to die had to shed his blood because there was no other way to procure salvation and satisfy that holy justice. Acts 4 and verse 12, neither is there salvation in any other for there's no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. It not only was based in the word of God and based in the wisdom of God and based in the justice of God, but it's also based in the wrath of God because the fiery serpent here is a reminder and an emblem of the curse. Remember the Bible talks about that old serpent, the devil. And through Satan and his deception, man sinned. And when man sinned, he came under a curse. 
The curse of sin. Is not what Paul teaches there? Turn over there to the book of Galatians. Look with me at Galatians chapter 3. And we'll read from verse 11. But that no man is justified by the law in the sight of God, it is evident, for the just shall live by faith. And the law is not of faith, but the man that doeth them shall live in them. Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law. How? Being made a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is every one that hangeth on a tree. Now remember the serpent of brass was put on a pole or a tree. Cursed is every one that hangeth on a tree. The serpent was an emblem of the curse. And here's the result that the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles through Jesus Christ, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. Now that's very important. That that's a tremendous scripture. The Lord Jesus in his death became a curse for us. He bore the curse of the broken law. He bore the curse of sin. And the serpent is an emblem of deception. And by that old serpent, as I've said, man sinned. Sin came into the world, death by sin. And men come under the curse of death. Not only the curse of sin, but the curse of death. Glory to God, there's no flaw in the type. A serpent of brass, Moses made. Brass speaks of judgment. Judgment and coming under the curse. And the Lord Jesus suffered the judgment of a holy God. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken thee? And he bore that justice of God, bore that wrath of God unflinchingly, willingly, voluntarily. Brass in the Bible is a, a very hard metal. And, and it can bear the scorching of the flame. Remember the, the brazen altar. What was it made of? It was made of brass. Because that was the place where the fire was the hottest. It's based in the wrath of God. Very quickly, it's based in the goodness of God. Notice what it says. And the Lord said unto Moses, Make thee a fiery serpent and set it on a pole. Make, not take. And Moses made a serpent of brass. Serpent of brass. Not an actual animal. Not one of the fiery serpents slithering about the camp. It was a likeness of the fiery serpent when he made a serpent of brass. Did our Lord Jesus Christ not take on the likeness of human flesh? We read over there in Romans chapter 8 and verse 3, speaking of our Lord Jesus. For what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, condemned sin in the flesh. The Lord Jesus came in the likeness of sinful flesh. To deal with sin. Not only was this a serpent of brass, was a serpent of brass without poison because it's a serpent of brass. There was no poison in this serpent. The brass serpent, serpent had no poison in him. The Lord Jesus had no poison of sin. He did no sin. He knew no sin. In him is no sin. The Lord Jesus was not under the curse because he had no poison of sin in him. And yet willingly, unflinchingly, voluntarily, he bore that curse for us. And the law that demanded eternal punishment or eternal perfection. The Lord Jesus, by his sinless life and his atoning death, earned everlasting righteousness by everlastingly and perfectly keeping the law of God. And he who had no sin offered himself a once and for all perfect sacrifice for sin, putting himself under the curse of the law, the curse of sin, the curse of death. And he bore that curse for us. Why? Out of love, out of grace, out of mercy. Do you know, we tonight are not saved by keeping the law. We're not saved by good works or religiosity or righteous deeds. We recognize that our Lord Jesus Christ kept the law of God perfectly for us. Because there was only one way to be saved, one way to be delivered. It was by one who had no poison of sin in himself. One who was not under a personal curse. And as I've said, it was not only a serpent of brass, a serpent of brass without the poison of sin, but it was a serpent of brass that was lifted up and put on a pole. 
Isn't that amazing development? It's not a wonderful detail. Does not bring us to Calvary, the middle tree. And you think of the, the wrath of a sin-hating God. And it's fully extinguished in Christ. What a wonderful Savior. Standing the scorching heat of God's wrath and God's curse against sin. That's the nature of the divine remedy. Very quickly, the noteworthiness of this divine remedy. What were the people told to do? Look again at our text. And it shall come to pass that every one that is bitten when he looketh upon it shall live. Look and live. Here's the, the miracle of healing associated with what is announced. All that are bitten with the poison of sin, all they had to do was look. So this remedy was proclaimed, look and live. And this remedy was portrayed. Christ is plainly and clearly set forth. Put it on a pole. Two million people in the camp could be seen from the center, right out to the edges of the camp. You see, the Bible said, if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost. And we cannot and dare not never lose sight of Christ. You think of an individual who's bitten by the serpent. The poison of sin is at work in his life. He's told, look, not to crawl, not to pay some cash, not to, to crave some ceremony, but simply and sublimely, look and live. There can be a reversal of the curse. The penalty of sin has been paid. The power of sin can be broken. The, 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 the passion for sin can be removed. You think of one who's bitten in body. Pain is wrecking that body. Fiery serpent has done its deadly deed. He's there in distress. What do I do? And he hears this announcement proclaimed in his hearing. Look and live. And looking, remember, symbolic of faith. It's whosoever believeth in him. It's, it's, it's um, tied into Isaiah 45 and 22. Um, look unto me and be ye saved, all the ends of the earth. It's a genuine gazing and looking and resting upon Christ. It's a looking to Christ. And it's not the look that saves but it's the one to whom we're looking. It's Christ himself. That's the noteworthiness of the divine remedy. And one final thing, the news of the divine remedy. I wonder how many times you've heard the gospel. The good news of Jesus Christ. And what is that good news? Look unto me and be ye saved, all ye ends of the earth. And yet to those that heard this announcement... And those that seen it portrayed in the camp, we read many died. Because the remedy was never applied to them. I want you tonight to look to Christ. I want you to remember that you've got to apply the remedy. You've got to look personally for yourself. And the promise is if you look, you will live. Remember what we read in the book of Isaiah? But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes are we healed. Isn't that tremendous? All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord hath laid in him the iniquity of us all. Can you go in at the first door and say, Lord, I, I'm a guilty, hell-deserving sinner. But I'm looking to Christ. I'm going to rest in him. I'm going to trust in him. I'm going to believe in him to the saving of my soul. You come out at the other all. The Lord has laid in him the iniquity of us all. It can be reversed. The poison is bite of sin. The penalty has been paid. The power can be broken in my life. And, and, and the pleasure of sin can be taken away. And one day, the very presence of sin, I'll never be there. I'll never be in hell because I'm bound for heaven. And bound for home. There's the news of the divine remedy. Look and live. It's as simple as that. It's sublime as that. I wonder tonight. Have you applied that personally in your life? Maybe you've heard the gospel for 10 years. 20 years. 30 years and more. But where are you tonight? Can you honestly say, I'm looking to Christ. And I've got spiritual life in heaven. I believed in him. I've got a genuine resting in him. 
to the saving of my soul. Oh, tonight, as you think about the divine remedy from sin unto salvation, think of how necessary it is. You have suffered the poisonous bite of sin. Think of its nature. It's based in the word of God. It reveals the wisdom of God, the wrath of God, the justice of God, the, the, the goodness and mercy of God. Think of how noteworthy it is. A remedy announced and portrayed. Look and live. And the news of it coming to you. You're the only one that can look and live. Nobody can look for you. You've got to look yourself. Look away to Christ. Turn over there in your hymn book to hymn number 228. 228. We'll sing in closing. I have a message from the Lord. Hallelujah. 228. Let's stand together. As we sing, please. Let's stand as we sing. Let's bow in prayer tonight. Think of these words. Life is offered unto you. Hallelujah. You haven't yet looked to Christ, have you? You haven't got eternal life. You haven't got that assurance. Why not? Maybe where you're standing, maybe where you're sitting listening to me right now, if you would like to bow your head, you just confess your sin to the Lord. You just look to him and pray a little prayer. Say to the Lord, God be merciful to me, the sinner. Look to Christ tonight. Look in faith. Believe in him. As you trust him to save you, he promises, whosoever shall call in the name of the Lord shall be saved. You could pray a little prayer just now as where you're standing, where you're sitting, and you can pray, Lord, save me. Now, if you would like to do that, feel free. I can't save you. Praying the prayer will not save you. Christ does the saving. But if you would like to tell us that you've called on the Lord, we'd be delighted to talk to you further and encourage you on the journey. Lord, take what has been of thyself tonight. We pray that you'll remember this gospel message, this simplicity, and yet this sublimeness of this Noteworthy news, look and live, write it in our hearts. To all who have heard it, use thy word for thy glory.
And we pray that through it, precious souls will be brought to saving faith in Jesus Christ. Lord, hear prayer now. Part us in your fear with your blessing. Take us to our homes in safety. We pray that the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of thyself, and the communion of the Holy Spirit will be upon us, both now and evermore. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you. Hi there. Thank you for joining with us on another Lord's Day evening. We really appreciate you giving of your time to tune in and watch our church online experience. We believe that the Lord's Day is a powerful opportunity, not only for us to worship together as one body, empowered by the Spirit of God, but also to preach the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. If you need support or desire help or wish to contact us, please do so via our website. If you want to help us, please like and share this video. For any new broadcasts and videos, don't forget to subscribe to our social media outlets online. Thank you for watching, and God bless.